Acorn TV is your home for streaming British crime dramas and mysteries. It's the only place you can catch up and stream the newest season of the UK hit series Line of Duty, a cat and mouse thriller from the creator of Bodyguard that takes a probing look into police corruption. Watch the first episode of season one for free at acorn.tv slash garage and start a free 30-day trial of Acorn TV with promo code garage. Would you like to be more informed about what's happening in the world? Meet The Skim, a daily email newsletter that has everything you need to start your day. In just five minutes, you get the major news and events explained in a quick, easy way. Plus, it's free and delivered right to your inbox. Subscribe at theskim.com slash garage. That's the S-K-I-M-M dot com slash garage. And be entered to win a $50 Visa gift card. Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me, as always, revealing all of the secrets of the universe, he is the captain. That's my favorite line when I take off my pants. It's good to be seen, and it's good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. This week, we are very pleased to be featuring Southern Pecan by the great folks at Lazy Magnolia Brewing. Southern Pecan Nut Brown Ale, according to the brewer, is the first beer in the world made with roasted pecans, and it makes a big, big difference, too. As I'm not a big brown ale guy, but this one is really, really good. Garage grade three and three-quarter bottle caps out of five. And this week's beer was brought to us from these beer fund contributors right here. First up, we have Sean and Bethany and Millis, Maine. And a big cheers down under to Aaron in Killarney Heights, Australia. In Parts Unknown, we have Keisha. And also in Parts Unknown, we have Kathleen who says, we have saved her from cubicle hell. And now she actually likes her job again. And a big cheers to Andrea in Naples, Florida. And here's a long distance cheers to Samantha out in California. She's in the Bay Area. And last but not least, we have Nora sending a big hello from England. So, Hello, right back at you. Thanks. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Thanks, everybody, for filling up the old beer truck this week. If you want to help us out with next week's shows, go to truecrimegarage.com, and we have a donate button there for you. Yeah, and if you haven't purchased a tank top, you need one for this tank top season. Sun's out, gun's out. Check those out at truecrimegarage.com, and that is enough of the business. Okay, everybody, gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. On Tuesday, May 6th, 2014, at 9.58 a.m., Peggy Wynn called Putnam County, Georgia, 911 from the home phone of a house she was in. When Putnam County picked up the call, Peggy is breathing hard. She tells them there's an emergency, and she thinks someone is dead. She goes on to tell them the house in which she is calling from is 147 Caroline Drive in Great Waters. She is calling from the home of Russell and Shirley Derman. Peggy explains that she is a neighbor of the Dermans, and she went to their home to check on them because they have been missing for about four days. Are they in the house, she is asked. Yes. I am, she replies. And then Peggy can be heard shouting, Oh my God, hysterically. 
Putnam County wants to know if they are both dead and if Peggy found them both. No, Peggy explains. It's just one. I don't know where the other one is. She is told they are sending a deputy and an ambulance over there just in case. Peggy thanks the operator and hangs up the phone. On the call, the dispatcher could hear Peggy talking to someone in the background, who sounded like he was saying she's not here or there's no one else here. Somehow, the 911 operator interpreted that there were multiple bodies on the scene. She dispatched deputies in an ambulance to respond to 147 Caroline Drive, saying that a woman called 911 screaming and she didn't know how many were dead. Peggy Wynn and her husband later told Putnam County Sheriff Howard Sills the following. The Wynn's who were in their 70s, were friends with Russell and Shirley Derman. They weren't next-door neighbors, but they lived less than a mile away within the same upscale gated community called Great Waters on Lake Oconee in the state of Georgia. The Winds hosted a Kentucky Derby party on Saturday, May 3rd at their home, and the Dermans were expected to attend, but never showed. Peggy called the Derman home a few times over the next couple of days, but there was never any answer, and she started to grow concerned enough that on Tuesday, May 6th, she made her husband accompany her over to the Derman home. They knocked, but received no response, and finding the front door unlocked, they went inside. They looked all through the pristine home which was over 3,000 square feet, and saw nothing on their first pass. The husband even glanced into the closed attached garage and noted that the couple's two cars were parked in their spots. Determined to look more thoroughly, the husband made a second pass in the house and actually stepped down the three stairs into the garage to check out the cars. There, behind the pale blue Lexus SUV and the Lincoln Town Car, he was confronted with the most horrifying scene imaginable. On the garage floor, lying behind the cars, lay the blood-soaked body of a man, lying in a dry pool of blood. Whether or not it was his friend Russ was unclear, the body lying on the garage floor had no head. 87-year-old Shirley Derman was gone, and so was the head belonging to this body. Before we get into the meat of this case, it's crucially important to convey an understanding of the setting because the nature of the location figures heavily into the story. Reynolds Plantation is an upscale lakefront resort community, roughly 80 miles southeast of Atlanta, Georgia. It's divided into several smaller gated developments with multiple golf courses and a lakefront Ritz-Carlton. All in all, Reynolds Plantation is over 1,500 residences, with the Great Waters subdivision where the Derman home was being the most exclusive. Great Waters, it's built around a Jack Nicklaus designed golf course and was a gated community with 600 residences. The Dermans built their retirement home toward the back of the development at the end of a cul-de-sac overlooking Lake Oconee. The house was situated so that the house fronted on the lake and the front lawn sloped down to the home's dock. The part of the house that faced the driveway was the back of the house. This is a very heavily wooded area. It was not at all open to the street or even clearly visible to neighbors. 
On the other side and across the street was just woods. It was secluded just the way the Dermans liked it. The area was extremely safe, with not so much as a burglary in Sheriff Sills' two-decade tenure up until 2014. Now, Lake Oconee is not a small lake. In fact, the 30-mile lake encompasses 19,000 acres and has 374 miles of shoreline. It is a man-made lake created by the building of a dam across the Oconee River. Lake Oconee is so huge that it touches four different counties. Construction of the dam flooded the area, included wooded regions, so that in parts of the lake, underwater trees are visible. The lake sees a huge boating scene in the warmer months. There are boat rental facilities, public boat launches, fishing outfitters, and every home has a dock. This is a very large house. Although there are many year-round residents, including retirees and families, one-third of the homes in the subdivision are occupied only seasonally. The summer season traditionally, the population of mostly rural Putnam County doubles to close to 45,000 people. Now, the man in charge of the investigation is Sheriff Howard Sills. He's the elected sheriff of Putnam County who has served in that role for 25 years. He is a cigar-smoking, cowboy-boot-wearing, no-nonsense lawman. A criminal justice major in college, trained at the FBI Academy, and he has been in law enforcement for about 45 years. As of May 6, 2015, day one of this investigation, he has solved every murder case and has sent five killers to death row. This is not a situation where the sheriff is a local yokel who botches investigations. Right. This guy, Sills, is the man. I watched a lot of interviews of Sheriff Sills. He's very uh, Tommy Lee Jones, you know, like in, in No Country for Old Men type thing. I didn't kill my wife. I don't care. <laughs> uh, Sheriff Sills was at the home, 147 Caroline Drive, very quickly when responding to that 911 call. He later admitted expecting to find a murder-suicide. First thing, he looked over the decapitated body that lay on the garage floor between the cars. The man's faded red t-shirt was partially pushed up. His blue and white striped boxer shorts drenched in dried blood. A bunched up bathrobe lay under the body. The man's bare feet were bloodstained. There was a dull red trail of blood which Sill says showed that the body had been moved a few feet. A pair of L.L. Bean slippers lay nearby. The corpse's hands were bruised and bloody. The left index finger had a severe gash all the way onto the palm of the hand. So defensive wounds. Yes. The head had been cut off along the line of the t-shirt collar in several what he describes as clean cuts. So whoever did this, he says, knew what they were doing. Based on information obtained from Russell Derman's driver's license, the body belonged to him. That's what the sheriff figured. Right. And a positive identification would later be made. On the garage floor was quite a bit of dried blood, with a large pool of blood and bodily fluids near the top of the body. Strangely, several towels lined the garage door crack where the door met the ground. Next to the left side of Russell's body, as if someone had ensured that the blood would not seep under the door and out onto the driveway outside. Hmm. So a sign of premeditation. Well, a sign of wanting to conceal this body as long as possible to the outside world. Right. To the right side of the body were more towels, clearly intended to soak up the excess blood. It was determined that the towels were from a bathroom in the Dermans' home. Just behind the Lincoln, Sheriff Sills found a blood spot on the garage floor as if something round had been placed there. Later, he said that it was larger than a head would be. And I know that's a pretty grotesque description there, but these are his words and his, his assessment of the crime scene. The rest of the house was in pristine condition. The 3,200-square-foot, four-bedroom, tan stucco house was neat, orderly, dirt, and dust-free. An unfinished USA Today crossword puzzle was sitting on the kitchen table, folded with the pencil still placed on top, and a prescription with Shirley Derman's name on it was on the counter next to a Netflix movie return. Mm -hmm. 
An open laptop was on the dining room table with a pair of glasses inside an open case nearby. Other than the garage, nothing whatsoever appeared to be disturbed. There was no forced entry, and we know the winds found the door unlocked. There was no sign of any kind of struggle or altercation, and nothing appeared to have been stolen. Shirley's two handbags with cash and cell phone were still on her vanity. Russell's wallet and cell were also in the home. A jewelry bag lay in plain sight. The only things missing was Russell's head and Shirley Dermott. So we have no sign of a struggle. We have no sign of a Mm break-in. We have no sign that anybody took anything of value. Right. So kind of rules out robbery. It could be a robbery gone bad. And then we find Russell, but we do not find his wife. Mm -hmm. It's a very weird situation. Um, and also I think what is not found in the home is key here. So the house was dusted for prints, but if Tex found any interesting prints, they were not released. They've not released that information. Right. The entire house was checked over using luminol and no blood whatsoever was detected other than in the garage. But even there, there was no spatter or spray, just the pooled blood around Russell's body. No weapons of any variety were found. Sheriff Sills has remarked that they did find some forensic evidence, but we don't know what that is or whether it has proved at all useful. Despite Sheriff Sills dragging the lake area around the Dermans dock and grid searches with dogs looking in nearby woods, nothing else was found. Because a perpetrator could be coming by car or foot or possibly by boat. Yes, the house would have been accessible by boat. A full-scale investigation into the disappearance of Shirley Derman was launched. Boats searched nearby areas of Lake Oconee using the latest sonar equipment and even a submersible robot, but this turned up nothing. Cadaver dogs failed to hit on anything near the house. The FBI was called in to help in the search for the likely abducted woman, and billboards went up all over the area to publicize her missing status. Meanwhile, an autopsy was performed on Russell's body, which wasn't that badly decomposed, even though it's estimated that he was dead for several days. The garage in the Derman home was air conditioned, so this slowed this process down. The GBI medical examiner ruled that the cause of death was cranial cerebral trauma because there was no evidence of any fatal injury to the body. Everyone was extremely relieved to learn that Russell had not been decapitated while he was still alive, which Sheriff Sills concluded based on the lack of arterial blood spray evidence in the garage or anywhere else for that matter. Some kind of traumatic injury had been inflicted on Russell's head, killing him. Now, without his head, it could not be determined for certain what that injury was, but the autopsy noted specifically that the decapitation was the result of a clean cut through the vertebrae and spinal cord leading Sills to conclude that it had likely been done with a very sharp blade and it happened in the garage. Well, right, and they don't have his head. They have his body, and we don't have wounds on the body that would make us believe that's how he died. So they just have to assume that the injury happened to his head. Sheriff Sills was operating under the assumption that Shirley Derman had been abducted and was in danger. He considered it was possible that Shirley was involved in Russell's murder, but what Sills was able to determine from the crime scene led him to discount this theory pretty quickly. Right. First of all, Shirley Derman was 87 years old, and she had physical infirmities that prevented her from easily handling stairs or walking down to the lakefront from the house. So the idea that that she did this by herself, that she managed to kill and decapitate her husband, move the body, and then disappear with the head on foot with none of her personal effects just seemed, I mean, almost an impossibility. So who were the Dermans? Russell was born in 1925 in Hackensack, New Jersey. Old Hackensack. Yeah. He attended college and he served in the Navy. He was a World War II veteran. After the war in 1950, he married Shirley, who was born in 1926, also in New Jersey. She attended Bernard College in New York. 
Russell worked as an executive at the General Time Corporation, the company, this company made clocks. The Dermans had four children, Brad, Keith, Mark, and Leslie. They moved to Atlanta in, 19, in the 1980s. Russell retired from the corporate world at age 58 and branched into fast food franchises, at one time owning 19 Hardee's locations. Mm. In 1998, he sold the business off to two of his sons, who had been employed by their father's business, and he and Shirley moved to their dream house on the lakefront at Lake Oconee. Russell was a regular golfer, and Shirley played bridge and enjoyed gardening. They had a dock in front of their house, as, as did the others, but they sold their boat in 2012. Remember, we stated that Shirley was having trouble getting down to the lakefront. This looks to me like a situation where an older couple might be downsizing a little bit. Yeah, and plus boats are a lot of work. Yeah. Just ask me, I'm a captain. I love boats, but they're a big pain in the ass. Uh, both were active in their church, had friends in the community, and were known to be just nice, normal folks. Many happy summers were spent with their kids and grandkids at their house on the lake. Let's go through the last sightings of the Dermans. On Thursday, May 1st, 2014, Russell ran some errands in town. We know from surveillance footage exactly where Russell went and what he did. At 2.15 p.m., Russell transferred money for an upcoming long-term care insurance premium via the drive through lane at the Lake Oconee People's Bank. Mm -hmm. He then traveled to the nearby Publix, a, a grocery store, arriving at 2.26 p.m. to pick up a prescription for Shirley. He also picked up a loaf of bread and a few cucumbers. He stopped and chatted with a gentleman in one of the aisles. Then he checked out and he walked out of the store. Now, also on that Thursday, May 1st, Shirley attended her twice weekly bridge group at 1230 p.m. Sometime before dinner, the Dermans' son, Brad, spoke to his parents on the phone. Like most days, he said they just chatted about how their day went. On Friday, May 2nd, a neighbor reported seeing Russell walking on the golf course in the community. Russell had recently given up golf and had taken to walking just to get some exercise. We don't know what time this was, though. This is, we don't have a time for this sighting. This was the last time anyone reported any sightings of Shirley and Russell Derman. At some point during the day on Friday, Shirley Derman sent an email, and we have no reason to believe that it was someone else sending it. We know from what was found in the house that Shirley worked on the crossword puzzle in the USA Today weekend edition, right. which is delivered on Fridays. It was found on the kitchen table. Her children told Sheriff Sills that she usually worked on the puzzle in the mornings. And we know that at 4.30 p.m. on Friday, the Dermans' mail was delivered, according to the mail carrier. Sher Sheriff Sills apparently has reason to believe that the mail was taken inside by the Dermans. Perhaps it was found inside the home or the mail carrier saw them. We don't, we don't know for certain how he came to this conclusion. In any event, Sheriff Sills is certain that the Dermans were alive and well at 4.30 p.m. on Friday, May 2nd. You'll want to check out ButcherBox. I am in love with ButcherBox. They make it easy to get high-quality meat that you can trust. Every month, ButcherBox delivers 100% grass-fed and grass-finished beef, free-range organic chicken, heritage-bred pork, and wild Alaskan salmon directly to your door, and shipping is free. ButcherBox believes in a healthier food system where everyone has access to meat the way nature intended, free of antibiotics, and added hormones, and humanely raised on open pastures. By taking out the middleman and purchasing direct from a collection of ranches, ButcherBox is able to buy meat and pass those savings along to you. Choose from four curated boxes or customize your own box so that you can get exactly what you and your family love. I love ButcherBox. I did a little surf and turf for some friends the other day with the Alaskan salmon and filet mignon straight on the grill. It's grilling season. So check out 
ButcherBox. You're going to love their website. It's informative, easy to use. Everything's delivered right to your door. The packaging is phenomenal, and the delivery is fast. So get grilling with ButcherBox. Celebrate the start of the grilling season with one of the best deals ever. To receive $20 off your first order and the ultimate barbecue bundle for free, go to butcherbox.com garage or enter promo code garage. That's two New York strip steaks, baby back ribs, and two pounds of ground beef free in your first box plus $20 off. Go to butcherbox.com garage or enter promo code garage. Check out butcherbox.com garage today. Support for today's show comes from HelloFresh. HelloFresh makes conquering the kitchen a reality with deliciously simple recipes and fresh, pre-measured ingredients delivered to your door. All meals come together in 30 minutes max, call for less than two pots and pans, and require minimal cleanup. Plus, with three plans to choose from, including classic, veggie, and family, there's something for everyone. So get out of that recipe rut and start cooking outside of your comfort zone. My kitchen told me the other day that I have conquered it because I am <sighs> using HelloFresh. And I I should also say I pour a little glass of wine during the process. I love it because it's simple, it's easy, and it's delicious. You just pick a plan. I get the classic. Get your delivery. HelloFresh arrives fresh and ready right at my doorstep. And then just cook, eat, and enjoy. It could not be more simple. It's fantastic. For $80 off your first month of HelloFresh, go to HelloFresh.com slash garage 80 and enter the promo code garage 80. That's HelloFresh.com slash garage 80 and enter the promo code garage 80 for $20 off your first four boxes. Fat Fit Fun is a seasonal subscription box delivered four times a year with full-size beauty, fashion, home, fitness, and wellness products for just $49.99 a box. And the 2019 Fat Fit Fun Summer Box is now on pre-sale. Fat Fit Fun allows women everywhere to discover new products as well as must-have brands you know and love. If you're stumped on gift ideas or want to send a care package, Fab Fit Fun is a great gift to yourself or a loved one. Every Fab Fit Fun box is guaranteed to have over $200 and retail value. In many products, individual value is more than the entire cost of the box. It's great for discovering new brands and products, and everything you get is full size. My sister loves Fab Fit Fun. I think it might be her favorite thing in the whole world right now. And the products that come in these boxes, these are like high-end products that you're getting for only $49.99 a box. Sign up for Fab Fit Fun today. These boxes always sell out. Use our promo code GARAGE to get $10 off your first box. Go to fabfitfun.com to sign up and start getting the box for a life well lived. Use our promo code GARAGE to get $10 off your first box. That's over $200 for only $39.99. Go to fabfitfun.com and use my promo code GARAGE to get $10 off your first Fab Fit Fun box today. That's fabfitfun.com. All right, we're back. Cheers, mates. Cheers to you, Captain. So based on these sightings and what we know about the crime scene, we can narrow down the time frame of when something happened to the Dermots. So between 4.30 p.m. Friday and 4 p.m. on Saturday, this is when they failed to show up at the Kentucky Derby party. Plus, Russell Derman's body had been found clothed in boxer shorts, a t-shirt, and a robe with slippers nearby. So he likely was either preparing for bed or had recently got up from bed. The bed was found unmade in an otherwise immaculate home. The Derman children told Sheriff Sills that if Russell didn't have a reason to get dressed first thing in the morning, you know, like an appointment or an errand, he was known to hang around the house in his robe until late morning. Yeah, I like the cut of his jib. In any event, whatever happened, Russell somehow being killed and surely being taken happened between Friday during the day and Saturday early afternoon. No one reported anything strange. Nobody reported any strange cars at the house or boats parked at the Dermans dock. So who could have taken this elderly, frail woman? 
And to what end? With more and more time passing with no answers as to Shirley's whereabouts, Sheriff Sills braced himself for a ransom note or call, but it never came. Then on Friday, May 16th, at 2.24 p.m., two men were out fishing on Lake Oconee near the Wallace Dam. Their boat neared a section of standing timber where underwater trees were visible. Yeah. The men spotted something in the water. As they got closer and approached the object, they were shocked to see that it was a human body floating face down. They called 911 and reported a body floating in the water against a tree. Lieutenant Luke responded to the scene via patrol boat. He located the body and called Sheriff Sills. Around 3 p.m., they pulled a bloated, waterlogged female body from the water. Sills said later that the body was swollen to twice its normal size and was decomposing. The body was fully dressed, wearing army green capri pants, brown and tan floral short-sleeved shirt, and laced size 8 white shoes. She was fully dressed. Yeah. Sheriff Sills was pretty sure that they had just found 87-year-old Shirley Derman. She had been missing for at least 10 days by this point. Although the cause of death was not immediately evident to Sills, it was clear that Shirley had not put herself into the lake. The body had floated to the top, which is a natural reaction to the gases that build up inside a decomposing corpse right. that is submerged. We, we have any wounds on her? Well, the reason, the, the obvious thing that he notes right away of why she didn't put herself in the lake is, you know, the body floated up to the top despite two red 30 pound concrete blocks tied to both of her ankles with a paracord. Yeah. The cement blocks were inside a bluish gray mesh bag. Someone had put the blocks in the bag, tied the bag to Shirley's ankles and thrown her into the lake. This is about five and a half miles from the Derman home. This area was accessible only by boat. Shirley's killer or killers used a boat to discard her body in 46 foot deep water. This is one of the deepest areas of the lake. She was positively identified as Shirley Derman by dental records. The autopsy found that Shirley's skull was fractured. She was struck at least twice on the right side of her head. Two V-shaped lacerations were found on her skull. But the skull fractures were round in shape, leading Sheriff Sills to guess that the weapon used was a hammer. Although he has reiterated that we do not know for sure what the weapon was. The cause of death was blunt impact injury of the head. There was no sign of sexual assault. The 550 or 550 paracord was wrapped around her ankles, and the lack of bruising indicated that the binding of Shirley's ankles occurred after death. Now, to save time, because we do have a lot to get to, right? Trust me when when I when I say this, I've looked into this, and this was an extremely thorough and exhaustive investigation. The agencies involved, led by Sheriff Sills, have looked into everything, and every inch and angle was looked at even extending his investigation into other jurisdictions and other states. So I want to give you just a small part of Sills' investigation, but not the whole thing because it would be, just be too much. Sills obtained tens of thousands of pages of the Dermans phone records and those of their children and others associated with them. No one detected any unusual calls or interactions with anyone. Anyone the Dermans had contact with was looked into. Sills canvassed the neighborhood and talked to over 200 residents. About 225 people were asked 30 questions, including where they were on the dates in question right. and whether they had any surveillance footage that could help the investigation. The interviewers discovered that, sure enough, one woman said she had seen a man in the Dermans' yard on that Saturday. This woman reported seeing a man from her vantage point in a house that wasn't very close by. She was not able to determine this man's race, age, or ethnicity. Uh -huh. But she says he was in the Dermans' yard on Saturday. Sheriff Sills met with her and reconstructed the vantage point 
she had and agreed that it was unlikely she could identify the man. It could even have been Russell himself, as far as we know. Sheriff Sills also interviewed Shirley's Bridge Club members, the pastor of their church and members of the congregation, all of their friends, a handyman, day laborers, and gardeners in the area, some of whom were subjected to polygraphs and passed. He ran background checks on the residents of Great Waters, looking for criminal histories. I mean, this is so strange. I mean, we have one person dead in the house, decapitated. You then take the other person. That doesn't seem to make any sense unless it was to get them into an area so you could do weird sexual things. The motive would be sexual, I think, once you remove the female. Or a ransom, but no ransom note comes. Mm-hmm. And then you find her in a area that would have to you'd have to get to by boat. But we don't know if the perpetrator got to their house by a boat. It's mm-hmm. very, very confusing. Well, you're pointing out something that's very spot on right here because the the alarming thing about this case and the difficult thing about this investigation. It, it really seems like you have to determine why the movements of the perpetrators were what they were. Yeah. And it's very difficult to determine that one because the lack of motive, but two, here's the thing when researching this, I found out that uh, one, when somebody's murdered and then decapitated, decapitation is pretty, it's a pretty low percentage of the time that that even occurs. Yeah. Then on top of that, when the head is removed from the crime scene, from the murder scene, that percentage is even much less. I couldn't find any statistics on a situation like this at all, where there is decapitation, head removed, and a second victim who's removed from the murder scene. Yeah. So in talking about the people that that Sheriff Sills looked at, I mean, that's a pretty thorough list right there. I mean, he even looked into the mailman. Yeah, and then you have this idea too, is is it two perpetrators because there's two victims? But it doesn't have to be like normally you'd go, okay, well, um, you have a a man and his wife and, and maybe there would be, it'd make it a lot easier if there's two perpetrators. Well, because they're an elderly couple, not necessarily. So it's like, now are we looking at one perpetrator or, or two? Well, all three of the Durman adult kids who lived in other states were interviewed multiple times, polygraphed and passed. Now, remember when we were discussing who the Dermans were, we mentioned that they had four children. Right. But one of their children had passed away before this ever happened. Okay. So Sills looked extensively into the Dermans' financial records. Sills noted that the Dermans were somewhat frugal and were careful with their money. They They were not overly wealthy. They were not in any way ostentatious or glitzy. They didn't even have ATM cards. Well, wouldn't they be children of the depression? So they'd be more frugal. Yeah. And I mean, I know we went through his career in his professional life, but the vibe I get here is, yeah, they did well and they were successful, but it seems to me like they may have got to where they were late in life by being frugal for most of their lives. More so than just making a bunch of money. Right. There was absolutely nothing unusual about any of their financial affairs. Sheriff Sills even insisted on being present when the Derman children opened their parents' safety deposit box, just in case there was something important inside, and he says there was not. Right. One of the first things Sheriff Sills considered was the security around Great Waters, around that development where the Dermans lived. This was an incredibly low-crime area. Of course, there were security cameras at the guard shack that monitored the entrance to the subdivision. Sills sent a deputy to obtain the camera footage from the days surrounding the Derman murders. But there was no footage. Doesn't it seem like it's just this this way every time? All the time. Yeah. Uh, The system had been fried a a few weeks earlier by a bolt of lightning from a storm on April 28th. So there are no recordings of the comings and goings and activities at Great Waters after that date. Yeah, but how many people in this area knew this? Probably quite a bit, right? 
I, I cannot say. I would speculate that in most situations, this isn't something that they would broadcast to the residents. You would think they would, right? As a safety precaution. Hey, our security cameras uh, have been compromised due to the lightning. I can't say for certain if it was general knowledge of the residents because yeah. I couldn't find that information. But what I can say is Sheriff Sills, who I consider to be incredibly knowledgeable and thorough, he obviously was unaware of it because he sent a deputy to collect footage that was not there. Sheriff Sills said that the only time his office had any interaction with the Dermans was back in 2012. This is when the Dermans had reported a credit card fraud incident. They had never reported anything else fishy ever or even called the police otherwise. The guard shack at the entrance to Great Waters, this was a typical little booth manned by a security guard who checked authorizations of those entering the development. In 2014, there was no arm that came down to stop access for cars trying to get in. The shack was manned 24 hours a day, and visitors had to be approved via telephone call to the residents. Residents themselves had stickers showing that they lived there, but others such as Great Waters maintenance men, landscape workers, repairmen, and so on, also could get temporary passes and were most likely just waved through if they displayed them. And people who told the guards that they were there to play golf or eat at the clubhouse were also admitted. Right. Sheriff Sill said that in theory, records of these people were kept, but it doesn't sound like it would be that hard for an outsider to enter the area. Security was pretty lax overall. The Dermans had a security system at their home but their son Brad indicated that it had been disconnected over Easter a few weeks before the murders. We haven't been able to gather any additional information about whether the home security system was out of order at the time of the murders or not, but it seems to be this way. Sheriff Sills has remarked that it was functional, but it was not turned on. But in another interview with WSB TV two, he indicated that the home security system had been disconnected twice in the few weeks before the murders. The Dermot children said that normally their parents would lock their doors and set the alarm at night, but clearly whether it was working or not, the alarm was not in use at the moment the Dermot's home was accessed by someone with sinister intentions. Also, the Dermot's home number and address were publicly available, so clearly they weren't too concerned about security. Sheriff Sills looked into all the boat rentals around the time of the murders on the assumption that the killers could have arrived by boat, bypassing altogether the guard shack and the risk associated with driving into and out of the community. Yeah. If he found anything, he isn't saying. There, there were no boat thefts reported around that time, if, you know, if even leading up to that days or weeks or months in advance. And no one reported that their boat appeared to have been used by someone else during this time as well. It is still possible that somebody could have used somebody's boat and returned it without them knowing. Mm -hmm. Sills looked into all similar murders, particularly decapitations around the country. Murders with decapitations are rare, with only three to four occurring yearly. And cases where the head is taken are even more rare. One case in New York seemed very similar. This took place in November of 2015 when 83-year-old Lois Colley was beaten to death in her home in an exclusive community. There was no forced entry and nothing was taken, and there seemed to be no motive. The clincher was that Miss Colley, Mrs. Colley's family owned fast food restaurants just like the Dermans did at one time. Yet law enforcement was not able to establish a connection with the Dermans. And in fact, the suspect was arrested in 2017 in the Collie case, but seems to have no links whatsoever to Shirley and Russell. Sheriff Sills consulted forensic experts as far away as China and utilized manpower from other law enforcement agencies as far away as London. He also sat down with six psychics over the years who claimed to have known nothing. 
Sheriff Sills interviewed eight to 10 former employees of Russell Derman and administered polygraphs to the lawn guy and the handyman who did some work around the Derman house. There was no other domestic help at the time, and it seems like these polygraphs led nowhere. Well, he's definitely doing his due diligence, and anybody that's willing to talk and anybody that's willing to give a polygraph, they're at least going through with it. Well, and that's why I point out that this investigation seems to be incredibly thorough. One, this is a guy who very, I mean, he clearly has the experience and the knowledge to take on this type of investigation. But he's also humble enough that he does get other people involved. And that's one thing that a lot of experts will say is once a case goes cold, you know, after, let's say, 12 months of getting no real leads that are that are taking you anywhere mm-hmm. and, and the investigation seems to just be going nowhere, that's when you get other agencies involved. You get new, fresh eyes on the crime, on the crime scene, on the evidence that you currently have and try to get some type of lead based off of other experts' experiences. So Sheriff Sills even borrowed two experienced detectives from the Jacksonville, Florida cold case squad. The detectives reviewed the case files with Sills to help him try to get to the bottom of this case. Sheriff Sills also periodically brought in experts from the DA's office and neighboring counties, as well as the FBI, to help aid in the investigation. Mm -hmm. Where it stands today, Captain, we still don't know what happened to the Dermans, who did this, and why. It also seems, too, like there would be access points to this water that might not be able to, they might not be able to patrol or know. So it could be a possibility, too, that the perpetrator would park somewhere else, access the water further away, and make it into the the subdivision. Yeah, and that brings up another good question too is if you have trouble establishing a motive here were the Dermans themselves actually targeted or was this person or persons just determined to enter the area and then choose a target at some point. Right. But again, why just for to to cause ha- harm to somebody because Again, we don't, there's no sign of burglary. You'd think that would be the motive, and there's no sign of sexual assault. So, is it just a thrill kill? Well, I think before we move on to some theories, let's let's go through a quick list of what we do, in fact, know. The, the facts of the case as it stands today. Mm-hmm. Because there is some new information that came out along the way. One thing that I really enjoy about Sheriff Sills is he's kind of an open book guy. He understands that there is certain things that as investigators they should hold back, but he's also of the type that he will put a lot of things out into the public and as a case goes on, he will add information to help break get a break in the case. Right. As we pointed out, before this incident This guy has solved every murder that happened during the course of his uh, tenure as the sheriff. So what we do know is this. Russell and Shirley Derman were murdered, and likely this happened sometime between late afternoon on Friday, May 2nd, and 4 p.m. on Saturday, May 3rd. No one broke in. There was no obvious signs of struggle. The couple was not restrained, and the couple likely was not killed in the home. That's a weird part. Okay. And, and I know that's tough for us to wrap our heads around here, but that is something that Sheriff Sills has said on, you know, news coverage and in interviews regarding this case. He says that he believes that they were likely not killed at home, meaning that there's little, there's no evidence to suggest that they were killed in the home itself, Mm -hmm. which is an added angle, difficult angle for this case, especially when you factor in that we don't really have any eyewitnesses, but the one who states they saw a man in the Derman's yard who could not be identified because of how far away this witness was. Mm -hmm. 
So Russell was decapitated with a very sharp tool, probably a knife. This occurred after death. And it, we do know that the decapitation did happen in the garage. There is evidence to um, back that up. His head has never been found. Russell was wearing what appeared to be the clothes that he slept in or was preparing to sleep in. Sheriff Sills later revealed, this is one of those interesting things right here. He later revealed after keeping this information under wraps for some time that a small amount of GSR was found on the back of Russell's shirt near his collar. Russell had this GSR on the back of his shirt and he was not known to be a sports shooter. So this points out that he may have been shot in the head before he was decapitated. Now, Russell had a deep laceration on his hand and hair was entangled in his hand. Shirley was killed by blows to the head with a hammer or another tool which crushed her skull. Shirley was likely taken away by boat, tied to the bag containing the concrete blocks and dumped in the lake after she was already dead. It's possible that she was driven away in a car to the other side of the lake and then placed in a boat. But either way, a boat had to be involved because of where the body was found and located. And I really circle this part in the investigation and who the killers may be. Well, hold on just to stop you right there. So you're saying a boat has to be involved based on where her body was found, mm -hmm. but the, but a boat would have to be involved for the dumping of the body, not necessarily the taking of the woman. Right. Right. And that, but that's what I'm pointing out and circling here is because of the location of where the body was found. Yeah. And because it was weighted down, you know, he brought in Sheriff Sills brought in the appropriate people to determine that the body didn't, it, it came out of the water shortly after it floated to the top. Yeah. And they also determined that it couldn't have moved more than a hundred yards from where the location was that she was eventually found. He actually thinks that it probably moved even less than that because as they pointed out in the 911 call, the body was lying up, was like snagged on one of those trees. So this is one of the deepest parts of the lake. And this is a very big lake. So Sheriff Sills is really reminding us here that, uh, that a boat in some form was involved in this case at some point. It has to be. So the killers or the killer came prepared as they likely brought the tools that were used on Russell. Remember, these items were not found in the house and there was no obvious things that were um, noticed to have been missing from the house. Mm -hmm. Shirley was found in deep water, as we pointed out earlier, about five and a half miles from their home. Nothing obvious was taken from the house. There were valuables left in plain sight. This really, really makes it confusing to the motive that was involved here. Now, if the eyewitness is to be believed, which Sheriff Sills says he believes this eyewitness, a man was in the Dermans yard, and this took place on Saturday. Some forensic evidence was found at the scene. Now, whether it be DNA, fibers, tangible evidence, or just something else, we don't know what that is. Although multiple news sources report that no foreign DNA was found, Sheriff Sills has said that he has, quote, forensic evidence collected at the house, but he is keeping mum on what it would be. Yeah, that could be anything. Yeah, there was no blood found on the grounds, on the dock, or in the home anywhere except the garage. We do know that in 2012, the Dermans were victims of American Express credit card fraud, where one of their cards was hacked and $2,000 in online expenditures racked up at Macy's and Amazon. They reported this to the Putnam County Sheriff's Office. This is the only interaction that the Dermans ever had with the sheriff's office. Russell and Shirley lived a normal, quiet life and were well-liked, social, and friendly. They were well-off but frugal and cautious with their spending. They were contemplating downsizing and had sold their boat. The family seemed to be close and loving. They seemed to have no enemies yeah. and were described as religious, sweet, unassuming family people.
Acorn TV is your home for streaming British crime dramas and mysteries. It's the only place you can catch up and stream the newest series of the UK hit series Line of Duty, a cat and mouse thriller from the creator of Bodyguard that takes a probing look into police corruption. Watch the first episode of season one for free at acorn.tv slash garage and start a free 30-day trial of Acorn TV with promo code garage. Make sure you sign up and subscribe to our show off the record on Stitcher Premium. We do a lot of updates of the cases we covered on there. And also we talk a little nonsense. We, we get a little silly. And for all of our old episodes, check us out on the Stitcher app exclusively on the Stitcher app, you can find all of our old episodes. And like the captain says, thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. Until next time, be good, be kind, and don't listen.